Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Peter Christian Eigner. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for the New York for New York City History at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. If you'll bear with me a second. There we go. Um, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us on this live stream. The video is being recorded and will be on the Gotham Center's YouTube channel soon. Um, if it's your first time with us, I also want to invite you all to learn more about the Gotham Center online at www.gothamcenter.org, where you can find digital exhibits, dozens of podcasts, hundreds of recorded interviews and panel discussions, and nearly a thousand articles, book reviews, and more on all things New York City history. Those of you looking for a deeper dive may also be interested in our new online education program. You can find new and past courses uh, at gothamed.com. With that said, today is part of our uh, regular series of free book talks showcasing the best and most interesting new work on New York City history. We'll be discussing Daphne Giannakopoulos' new book, The Pirate's Wife. After thousands of books written over the centuries, it is not easy to say anything new about pirates, the great historian of the subject, Marcus Redeker writes. But that is precisely what Daphne Giannakopoulos has done in this lively tale of the remarkable Sarah Kidd. The English-born New Yorker was just 21 years old, but already twice widowed to prosperous merchants in the British colony when she married the 37-year-old William Kidd. Both of them were respected members of high society, so much so that no one even looked into the peculiar circumstances of Sarah's second husband's death. William had gained prominence in Leisler's Rebellion, the upheaval that rocked the colony over the glorious revolution in England. And Sarah, for her part, was an unusually independent textiles importer with a shop on Pearl Street, who lent a considerable hand even in establishing Trinity Church, the elite parish where she is buried and the pair had one of the frontmost pews. Yet in the space of a decade, the pair, the two would be, would spend, both spend time in jail and William would be sent, sentenced to die in London. Just a few years after he had won a letter from the king himself to hunt ships as a colonial privateer, William had become the most wanted pirate perhaps in the empire. His corpse dangling for years as a warning wildly popular song on both sides of the Atlantic mythologizing his swashbuckling tale. Written in the style of an historical novel, girded with, but girded with the slippery context of the imperial mercantile system, which inadvertently allowed piracy to flourish, Pirate's Wife is, quote, a fascinating and intriguing story about the woman behind one of the most iconic pirates of them all, as the other great historian Eric J. Dolan adds. I will stop there so you can learn more about the subject from the from about this book from the expert. Uh, but allow me first to briefly introduce our speaker. Daphne Giannakopoulos is a former congressional aide with a PhD in liberal studies from Georgetown University. A regular contributor to the New York Times syndicate, syndicate's Life Beat column, she first became interested in pirates while researching an article for the Wide Wide Pirate Museum in Provincetown. Apologies if I messed that up. Uh, for the newspaper in 2002. Ever since, she has been conducting research on the subject, which has taken her into the archives in Rhode Island, to archives in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, London, Washington, and of course, New York. Her first book, The Pirate Next Door, explored the human side of this world by looking at four captives, captives, captains active during the so-called golden age of piracy from 1650 to 1725 examining the lives, the wives, the families, and the communities of Samuel Bellamy, Paul's Grave Williams, Samuel Burgess, and William Kidd. Going beneath their reputation as outlaws and outcasts to probe their inner lives, their faith, their communal ties, and their great loves, which of course brings us back to Sarah. I'm gonna turn it over to Daphne now to tell us her tale, but first the usual bit of housekeeping. As always, presentation and discussion will last until about 7.30 or so, at which point uh, we'll take your questions. We have disabled the chat function out of respect to our speaker, but I encourage you to send in questions at any time during the next hour 
using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. But with that, please join me in welcoming our guest with the usual bit of silent applause. Thank you, Peter, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the Gotham Center for New York City History for hosting this virtual event. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you tonight about a book that I've been working on for many years. It is the first ever direct account of the life of Sarah Kidd, the wife of the notorious pirate Captain Kidd. Sarah lived a long and storied life, and I'm gonna give you a glimpse into it. I'm gonna show you some slides, and I'm gonna do a reading from my book. I hope you all will find Sarah Kidd to be easily as interesting and remarkable as her famous husband. Generations of readers the world over have known the story of Captain William Kidd, the noble sea captain and privateer who turned ruthless pirate. The history of the golden age of piracy in which Captain Kidd played an outsized part is replete with the exploits of pirates of many stripes who, who hoisted the black flag and prowled the seas attacking merchant vessels bound for the West Indies, West Africa, and North America. Kidd's story is particularly striking. In 1699, Captain Kidd became the subject of a deadly political scandal, including top officials on both sides of the Atlantic, including the King of England. There was a worldwide chase an eventual conviction and execution at the hands of colonial officials who may have been complicit in Kidd's darkest acts of piracy. It was a drama laced with lies, secrets, double dealing, betrayal, and buried treasure. The story of his journey from privateer to murderous pirate has been immortalized across the centuries in print, on stage and screen, in video games, and even in an epic 22 verse ballad. But our understanding of his legend is incomplete. What is largely unknown is that Kidd had a partner and accomplice, a behind the scenes player who enabled his plundering and helped him outpace his enemies. This accomplice was his wife, the English-born Sarah Kidd, a young, well-to-do New York socialite whose extraordinary life is a lesson in reinvention and resourcefulness. Sarah was running a thriving merchant business in the New York City seaport when she met Captain Kidd. The encounter set off a high-octane romance that often operated outside the law. While Captain Kidd was plundering the high seas, Sarah Kidd was pirating in her own way within the confines of polite society, working to ensure that her husband never got caught and that the location of his buried treasure stayed secret. With bold determination to survive and protect her husband, Sarah secretly aided and abetted him, fight it, fought alongside him against his accusers. The most impressive part is that even after Captain Kidd was put to death for his crimes, Sarah remained an incredibly beloved fixture of the community. She secured a long and prosperous life for herself and for her children. Sarah knew how to persuade and she knew how to hustle. And in a time when women held little legal power, she found a way to ensure her future and protect her family. But for more than 300 years, the story of Sarah Kidd has been all but erased from history. My journey into the world of pirates began in 2002, when I was commissioned by the New York Times to write a freelance piece for their museum's special section 
about the Witta Pirate Museum in Provincetown, Cape Cod. The museum contains artifacts recovered from the Witta pirate ship that crashed during a fierce nor'easter off the coast of Wellfleet, Cape Cod in 1717. Prior to writing this article, I didn't know much about pirates, except what I had read in books and seen in movies. I thought all pirates had a pet pirate, pet parrot, like Long John Silver in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, or looked like the handsome and fit Errol Flynn in the 1935 new movie, Captain Blood, or more recently walked, talked, and wore eyeshadow like Jack Sparrow in the movies, Pirates of the Caribbean. Looking at everyday artifacts recovered from the pirate ship, silver coins, cutlery, pewter plates, a teapot with the shoulder blade of a pirate, Pistols, cannon, navigational instruments, medical supplies, and even a size five leg bone and silk stocking. I realized that these mythological figures were mere ordinary men. The legend of the captain Samuel Bellamy and his love interest, Maria Hallett, told me that pirates had connections on land they had families and community links that we didn't know much about. As I was researching my dissertation turned previous book, the, Pri the Pirate Next Door, the untold story of 18th century pirates, wives, families, and communities, I kept encountering this mysterious woman. She seemed oddly on the periphery of the story of the notorious Captain Kidd. Even the influential and authoritative early source book on pirates called A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates, written by Captain Charles Johnson, did not include Sarah in the lengthy chapter on Captain Kidd. Sarah was alive at the time when the book was published in London in 1724, and it would have been possible for the author to interview her or people who knew her. Finding Sarah's initials, SK, scratched on a colonial document at an archive in Boston, started me on a thrilling journey to learn more about her. I would soon learn that her initials marked the spot where love and law divide. To research Sarah's story, I had to use a variety of sources because women left little record of their affairs. Most women, including Sarah, could not write. Men owned all the property and exercised most of the legal rights at the time. I read the contextual history of pirates of the time and of the political, economic, and cultural events that shaped Sarah's life. I was able to find some important primary sources on Sarah, such as her petition that she sent to the governor of New York to regain her seized property and her last will and testament. <clears throat> Many of the ancient documents that I relied on were handwritten and I transcribed over 250 of them to make them easier to work with. I visited archives in the places Sarah and Captain Kidd had been, including those in New York, Boston and Rhode Island. <clears throat> I walked the steps where Sarah had walked especially in New York, where she spent most of her life. I also found great resources in the Admiralty Papers at the National Archives in London, and I found a rich cache of letters that were in a sea chest in Captain Samuel Burgess's pirate ship when it was captured by a British privateer in 1699. The letters were in the pirate's mailbag and contained a few letters from Captain Kidd's crewmen aboard the Adventure Galley to their wives and the wives to Kidd's crewmen. The letters were dated from 1695 to 1699, and they show that correspondence was conducted thousands of miles across the globe between Indian Ocean pirates and North American colonists and back again. 
No letters from Sarah or Captain Kidd were among these letters, and none have survived, but there is every likelihood that they communicated during his three-year voyage through the Mariner's Mail Service, located on Ascension Island, a remote outpost in the Atlantic Ocean. New York merchant captains trading with the pirates in Madagascar stopped for fresh supplies of turtle meat and dropped off and collected the mail left under a rock with a hole in it near the harbor. This letter from the wife of Kid's crewman, Jacob Horn, was especially helpful and informative. Writing from their home in Flushing, New York on June 5th, 1698, Sarah Horn told her husband, quote, we hear abundance of flying news about you, end quote. This meant word had spread, spread from port to port and ship to ship, and that there was trouble aboard the adventure galley. That trouble, we would later learn, was murder, mutiny, and piracy. To further understand the maritime world in which Captain Kidd was a part of, I attended a workshop at the National Archives and conducted research with scholars from the Prize Papers Project, a collaborative effort of the National Archives with the University of Oldenburg in Germany to research and categorize the thousands of yet unopened documents that were captured by the British in wartime in the 17th and 18th centuries. I examined trial records, depositions, personal correspondence, ship's logs, cargo inventories, and even a mariner's personal journal that was worn from wear in his front pocket. The manuscript room at the Library of Congress was a terrific resource, and Captain Kidd's own record recorded statements gave strong evidence of his relationship with Sarah. Archivists and other historians I met were enthusiastic and helpful during my research, as was my trusty research assistant Higgins, a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named for a runaway pirate, Jeremiah Higgins. Here he is inspecting the galleys of the pirate's wife. Unfortunately, there are no contemporary paintings of Sarah Kidd. She can't be seen that way. But in 1911, the artist Jean-Léon Jérôme Fair created this painting of Captain Kidd in New York Harbor. The attractive, beautifully dressed woman with a lace fan holding Captain Kidd's hand on the deck of his ship is an interesting rendition of a woman who has captured Kidd's attention. One contemporary of Sarah's described her as lovely and accomplished. And the woman in this painting is certainly lovely. Kidd's velvet knee length coat, a sword at his side and a tri-cornered hat or are historically accurate depictions of the attire of the period and what he would have worn as a successful sea captain. His gesture towards his lovely visitor, a suave gentlemanly bow and a warm clasp of her hand fits with the charming demeanor he was known to display. While this painting is a figment of the artist's imagination and in 1911, we did not know the story of Captain Kidd and Sarah there is, coincidentally, some historical semblance of truth in it. Sarah Bradley arrived around 1670, the future wife from New York, from England to New York, with her widowed father and two brothers when she was 14 years old. At 15, she was married to one of the wealthiest men in the colony, a much older New York merchant named William Cox. When Cox died tragically four years later in 1689, Sarah was 19 years old. A year later, she married a Dutch merchant named John Ort. It was then that she met Captain William Kidd, 
a well-respected gentleman with whom she began a casual friendship. Captain Kidd was Sarah's third husband. Sarah was a twice widowed 21 year old, considered one of the most eligible and sought after women, sought after women in New York when she and Kidd married just two days after her second husband's death. While the circumstances might appear suspect for Sarah and Kidd to marry so soon after her second husband's untimely demise, Kid and Sarah were stellar members of polite New York society. They were New York's power couple. No untoward behavior was ever proved. At the time of their marriage, the well-built, well-dressed 37-year-old sea captain who spoke with a hint of a Scottish accent was one of the most respected men in Manhattan. He was a celebrated war hero and sought after privateer. A privateer was hired by the government to legally plunder and seize enemy ships. He was a legal pirate. During wartime, the resources of warring countries were stretched to the limit and privateers were extra hired hands who owned their own armed vessel and served as an auxiliary to England's Navy. A privateer's assignment was detailed in a document called a letter of mark and reprisal. He had investors and the captured, captured prizes and cargo was shared with his investors. The captain and crew got a smaller proportion of the take. There was sometimes a fine line between a legal privateer and an outlaw pirate. Many a privateer once out at sea and beyond the reach of authorities turned pirate to avoid having to share the loot. There were other reasons for turning pirate though. Turning pirate was an attractive alternative for some men, especially, with, especially those with wives and families because pirates <clears throat> lived in a highly civilized democratic society. They were well paid when the going was good and they were treated fairly. Pirates lived by a set of rules called articles, and each pirate had to sign his name, or if he could not write, leave his mark as an X to join the crew of his pirate ship. With this commitment to be true to his fellow brethren of the coast, as they were called, came benefits. Each pirate had an equal vote, and most were given an equal share of the booty. There was a form of health insurance, life insurance, and retirement benefits. The pirate community was designed to support and maintain the relationships on land while they were at sea. <clears throat> For example, if a pirate died in action, his share of the booty was smuggled halfway around the world and given to his family. Turning pirate was a risky and dangerous choice. But for some men, a merry life in a short one was their motto. Sarah and Kid's wedding took place in Manhattan on a rainy Saturday, May 16, 1691. It was a day of high drama and grisly 17th century justice. England was at war with France. Pirates were plundering the high seas and two traitors the self-appointed governor, Jacob Lester, and his son-in-law, Jacob Milbourne, were hanged for treason against King William and Queen Mary in the public square. Sarah and Kidd attended the hanging after their wedding. A public hanging was an event everyone turned out for. It was a carnival-like source of entertainment. The stark contrast of the day, a love match, and an execution foreshadowed the dark drama that would be their life together. The kids lived in a mansion Sarah inherited from her first husband, located on the corner of Pearl and Hanover Street. Whoops, sorry.
Located on the corner of Pearl and Hanover Street in the Hanover Square neighborhood of Manhattan. The waterfront property faced a wall now called Wall Street in the financial district of Manhattan. Coincidentally, their home was just a few blocks from the offices of my publisher, Hanover Square Press, an imprint of HarperCollins. I like to think Sarah helped me find my publisher. Around 1692, Sarah gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. And in 1694, she had another daughter, little Sarah. During the colonial period, giving birth was a social and bonding event where women looked after one another. Sarah's babies would have been, at home, been born at home in a separate area away from the main living quarters. Men were not involved in the birthing process, so Captain Kidd would have been busy somewhere else. It was the job of women, relatives, neighbors, friends, and elders in the colony to act as midwives to assist in the delivery. Special birthing linens were prepared and laid out. Sarah would have used a birthing stool or perhaps a loved one held her upright and supported her as she progressed through labor. In the early stages, Sarah would have acted as the hostess of the festive occasion. It was an old English tradition for new mothers to serve groaning cakes, a sweet, nutritious baked good made of spices, molasses, rum, apples, and carrots. And to go with the groaning cake was groaning beer. As they waited for the blessed moment, the women would entertain themselves with gossip, jokes, and stories. In 1696, Captain Kidd was given a dream job. Two privateering commissions from the King, William III. His investors were some of the most important men in England, including the newly appointed governor of New York and Massachusetts named Richard Coote, who was known as Lord Belmont. Belmont's complicated relationship with Kidd would lead to Kidd's tragic downfall. In his brand new ship that looked like something like this, the Adventure Galley was a 287-ton warship with three tall masts, square rig sails, and 34 big guns. It was a hybrid ship called a galley, meaning that it could ro be rowed as well as sailed. His job was to hunt French enemy ships and to rid the seas of pirates who disrupted international trade. His commission was for one year and his initially unsuccessful voyage led to frustration, mutiny, and eventually kids turned to piracy. Sarah was key to Kid's fight for his life against the men who accused him of turning from privateer to pirate. She and their daughters spent time on Kid's pirate ship, and Sarah helped Kid hide his stolen treasure. As an accomplice to an outlaw, she was arrested and imprisoned with him in Boston. Once released, Sarah helped construct the narrative Captain Kidd presented in his defense. She ensured he was taken care of in jail. She worked tireless, tirelessly to help secure a pardon, and she even tried to help plot an escape. After Kidd was executed in 1701, Sarah lived another 40 years. She reinvented herself and managed to go from one half of a criminal outlaw couple back to a high society socialite. She secured her family's inheritance, remarried, had more children, and lived the rest of her life as a prominent and respectable citizen. She even learned how to write her name. Sarah's life is a rare example of the kind of life that pirate's wives lived during the golden age of piracy. Hers is a tale about love, marriage, motherhood, and survival. Sarah's life 
and particularly her transformation from a New York socialite to a stateless outlaw, sheds new light on the political, economic, and cultural events of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. From her, we learn about the economic hardships of widowhood, the political repercussions of piracy, the effects of war on the new and emerging colonial colonies, and the business of slavery. Her life tells a broader story about how certain women were able to assert their will and reclaim their agency when they're within the oppressive strictures of colonial America. During her 74 years, Sarah lived through seven British monarchs, 21 New York governors, and she experienced firsthand the golden age of piracy. She survived four husbands and three of her five adult children. The Pirate's Wife, the remarkable true story of Sarah Kidd, recasts the image of Captain Kidd from a diabolical pirate to a flawed and decent man who tried to please his investors and protect his wife and family. Yes, he was a pirate, but he was not one with a black heart. Sarah's initials, SK, scratched on a few colonial documents, gave clues to her existence. Those bold, Ben, bold pen strokes reveal a history we have only imagined, the dangerous, difficult, and thrilling life of a pirate's wife. They shed unexpected light on a young colonial woman caught up in a world of pollux, politics, passion, and grisly 18th century justice. The unknown SK is finally identified she is Sarah Kidd, the First Lady of Pirates. I'd like to close by reading a passage from The Pirate's Wife. This is from the prologue. Sarah Kidd lived, Sarah Kidd lay in a weakened state in the bedroom of her Manhattan mansion. A highly contagious lethal disease raged through the colony, striking young and old, rich or poor, black or white. It was September 12, 1744, and the 74-year-old Sarah had first taken to her bed to get warm under her soft quilts and to rest her head on the goose down pillows. Then the chills, fever, and fatigue set in. She was nearly certain she had contracted the deadly disease everyone called diphtheria. As a precaution, she asked her family and friends to stay at a safe distance. She arranged for soft foods and a soothing drink made from the medicinal herbs in her garden to be left outside her bedroom door. Her mind wandered in a fever-induced haze. She closed her eyes and remembered herself in another time and place. She was a young woman with her husband, Captain William Kidd, on his pirate ship, the St. Antonio, a vessel laden with gold, silver, and jewels. As his closest confidant, she learned that he had buried some of his stolen treasure for safekeeping, and he described to her where it was hidden. She was not to tell a soul. For more than 40 years since her death, since his death in 1701, Sarah, the pirate's wife, kept his secrets safe. Not even her five children knew. She alluded to it in her will, noting that she had assets in the city of New York and elsewhere. She did not identify elsewhere. Sarah worried about the consequences if her children were caught with stolen pirate loot. Her instincts told her it was best to leave well enough alone. 
As she thought back over her life, not all of her memories were fond ones, especially the time when she was a pirate's wife. But the memory of the hardships and the heartbreak had softened, and Sarah would not have traded it for anything. She felt proud, very proud, to have been a pirate's wife, and she wore the title as a badge of honor. Sarah repeat, repeated a prayer as her condition worsened. Almighty God, have mercy on my soul and pardon and forgive me all my sins and offenses so that I may, after this miserable life, arise with our Savior, Jesus Christ. She became delirious from the fever and shook uncontrollably. The sheets were soaked with her perspiration. Still, the thought of that secret weighed on her, as well-kept secrets often do. As she prayed for forgiveness, she may have thought it was time to identify elsewhere to her children, who paced downstairs in the sitting room. It wasn't long before Sarah developed a sore throat that felt like a razor when she swallowed. She tried to speak, but it hurt so much she could only whisper. Her daughter, Elizabeth Kid Troop, peeked through the keyhole to check on Sarah. The once vigorous woman now appeared very small among the many furnishings and tasseled curtains. She looked pale in her white cotton bed clothes and so frail, lying on her side facing the door. Elizabeth saw her mother's lips moving, mouthing words, but she could not hear her. She strained through the keyhole to hear what she might be whispering. Elizabeth called for her brothers, William and Henry, who had stopped, stepped outside on the front stoop that faced the harbor. The cry of the seagulls seemed to signal the alarm. Elizabeth told them to hurry. Sarah's breathing was loud and strained as she gasped for air. The three of them looked at each other with tears in their eyes when the room fell quiet. There was not a sound, not even a whisper. For over 300 years, treasure hunters have scoured the North American Eastern Seaboard, trying to find where elsewhere is. That secret is with Sarah, buried in the churchyard of Trinity Church Wall Street in Manhattan. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, I wanna remind everyone before we have a little conversation here that if you have questions for Daphne, you should send those in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, Daphne, I, I want to um, just uh, start a little bit, uh, maybe sort of at the beginning here. You told us about the research for this book. Um, what about the historiography? Was there nothing on Sarah? Um, was what was in the record? Was there anything? What did you learn? Was was there? Uh, was there? Did they get anything right? Did they get anything wrong? Or was she literally just erased from the story? She was. A, she was not included in the story. Um, the seventeen twenty four, which is the earliest book on piracy, piracy um, did not include her, and that was because women couldn't write. And so they didn't leave journals or diaries or letters to make it easy for us. Um, yep. And also pirate history was written by men for men. And then um, I think we need to, especially as the director of the Gotham Center, um, uh, address this question about the billing. Um, so uh, we've talked for a little bit about Sarah and about William. Um, what about New York in this? Uh, New York is considered, you write, was considered the utopia in this golden age of piracy. Um, 
why was it a golden age and why was New York the utopia? You mean, why was New York considered a, a golden place for pirates to go? Mm -hmm. Well, that was because under the governor, Benjamin Fletcher, um, he welcomed pirates because the colonies uh, needed money and uh, England needed money because they were at war with France. So the governor thought that he would help the uh, monarch by producing money. But what he did was he also mostly benefited himself by lining his pockets. But he did welcome the pirates to the harbors of uh, New York. And um, he gave them special dispensation that he wouldn't arrest them and would give them free passage into the colony if they would pay him a fee, which he pocketed. But they did serve a lot of benefit to the colonists because pirates brought in bags and bags of uh, gold and silver coins. And there's a shortage of coins because of the Navigation Acts, which really strapped the uh, colonists of uh, currency. So having currency in the, in the colony was a great benefit, but especially attractive for, of having pirates was the goods that they brought in. They brought in exotic goods from the other side of the world that the colonists could not get. And since pirates did not have an overhead or a very little overhead, they could offer it at rock bottom prices to the merchants. And the merchants could make a very nice profit on it. And it sustained the colony because if the, mod, if the merchants were doing well, then they could build houses and they could build businesses and the colony thrived during this time. But uh, Benjamin, F Governor Benjamin Fletcher didn't last very long because it was quickly learned how he was benefiting the colony and he was replaced by Lord Belmont who then became um, involved with Captain Kidd. And Belmont's, um, uh, his his directive was to stamp out piracy, get rid of the pirates in the colony. Well, I think this is what um, uh, is, uh, you know, I mean, one of the more, most interesting things about the subject is that there's this slippery sort of nature to the relationship, right? So pirates are sort of in long depicted in popular culture as these outlaws and outcasts who are sort of hated and yet that's not quite so, right? They sort of serve a role, they're, they're, they're welcomed and supported even at times by um, merchants and um, other people in the community. And that's part of how you know that that's part of how they sort of evade capture at times. And um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? And the slippery way, I was, you know, thinking particularly about the, you know, the line between what is a pirate and what is a privateer and why so many of the people in the latter category, officially sanctioned by the state to serve a purpose, slip into the former category where they're prosecuted by the same state. Right, and and many a, um, many a privateer, he would like, for example, Captain Kidd, he, when he left, Sarah thought she was married to a privateer, you know, a war hero, a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, a privateer by, by day, a pirate by night. And um, it, it was a very slippery slope. It, it's really interesting to, to uncover the, the lives of pirates because the, the uh, culture that the pirates developed for themselves was very, very sophisticated. And they, they even allowed pirates that if they had had enough of the pirate life, that they could retire yeah. and they could catch the next boat from Madagascar, the next ship from Madagascar. They could pay a hundred pieces of eight to the merchant for a trip back to New York. And the pirates could would slip back into 18th century society. Um, they were very often protected by the community. 
several of them married governor's daughters. It was it was um, a, a really fascinating side of society that we just don't even think about. We think of them as these one dimensional sociopaths, but they were three dimensional uh, men who had needs to take care of themselves, take care of their wives and families. And they, they just did it how they could. Well, maybe we can then um, follow up a little bit more on that question before, but you know, why, why the golden age and, and what purpose are these men serving? Um, why is it that there's such a need for privateers? Um, and why is it that we see this surge of piracy that, that develops around the same time? Well, the need for privateers was as a result of wars and um, the British monarch, they just, the navies didn't have enough men and um, they would often go and um, uh, they would have to capture men and, and convince them to um, serve in the Navy. But they were during wartime, there just weren't enough men. So they hired uh, these captains with their own private vessels to be uh, auxiliaries to the Navy. So as long as there was war, there was often privateers. And um, the reason that men turned pirate was that uh, privateers had investors and um, they had to share a lot of their loot with their investors. And being out at sea in the 17th and 18th centuries was a very hard life. And these men quickly realized that when they were out of uh, the earshot of their investors and the authorities that um, keeping a good share of the loot for themselves was a really good idea. Um, and it was risky and there's lots of uh, songs about you know a happy life and a short life for me but but that's that was the way it was and the the pirate crew was made up of a really mixed a mixed bag of of men from many cultures who spoke many languages some of many of them were runaway slaves and they were all created or, or all treated equally on board ship so that was a very attractive alternative for crewmen to um, turn pirate and be in this community of men that was a brotherhood. Yes, some of the uh, people in the audience may know this is one of the reasons why they've actually become a, a subject of particular fascination to historians is that this sort of uh, rather democratic culture emerges from this uh, essential part of the, the workforce, right? It's not just for pirates, but for Maritime workforce generally. Um, right. right. Uh, uh, and so, what about uh, William's story then? I mean, William, I think, fits um, quite. I, I mean, Sarah is absolutely fascinating. But since we're since we're talking about um, the pirate side of of the story, um, William himself has quite a, a few friends that that sort of carry him through this story. I mean, people will, I think, recognize the names of John Gardner, Robert William Livingston, and other people from the period. Um, he doesn't, he's sort of typical of this story, right? He doesn't sail with the Jolly, Jolly Roger, right? And he's sort of pushed into the life of piracy. You wanna say a little bit about this question of whether or not um, he intended to sort of become the person that he was, uh, that maybe sort of forced into uh, becoming? Sure, he he had no intention of turning pirate. Um, his, his assignment was for one year. His letter of mark was specific for one year. But after one year, he did not capture any prizes, which meant that he didn't catch capture any French French enemy ships. So he didn't have anything to show for his time at sea. <clears throat> so he extended it a second year and he didn't have a very much then either. So he extended it a third year. And by, a, by the third year, his men were very weary. Uh, his ship, his brand new ship was leaking, the Adventure Galley. 
Um, and his men were mutinous because Captain Kidd had not, um, he just didn't have much to show for it. And here are these men had been at sea for three years and their wives are waiting for them or their families, or he, they have no money, by the way. You know, there's no paychecks when you're out at sea and you're um, <clears throat> hoping to capture steel from en the enemy ships. So it, it's, a, it's a tough life and uh, the conditions are hard. The uh, food's terrible. Um, so um, the men after three years turned mutinous and um, Captain Kidd claimed until the very, very end. And he always claimed he was innocent until he was hung. He claimed he was innocent, that it was his men who, um, who, who made him turn mutinous. Now, where he got into big trouble was because his men were so mutinous and the morale on board ship was so low, one of his men, the gunner, um, mouthed off to him. And no captain could have um, insolence among his crewmen. And what Captain Kidd did was he hit him over the head with a wooden bucket and the guy died the next day. And so his mutinous men said, oh great, now we got another thing to blame on him. So they called him a murderer and that, that spread from uh, ship to ship and port to port. And he was known as a murderer and a pirate. Um, and meets a rather sticky end. Um, do you want to say anything about that before we tack back to Sarah? Um, he doesn't get a dispensation, although he tries. <clears throat> Doesn't he manage does. to escape either, although there's plotting. He 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 believes that he is going to be given a pardon because his his main investor is Lord Belmont, the governor of New York, and he is lured back to Boston by the governor to um, believing that the governor will pardon him because the governor says he will. So. Um, but Kid covers his bases and he hides his treasure. And he also has treasure down in Hispaniola. So he has another ship full of treasure. But he really believes that he was innocent and that he would be pardoned because he did have, during his voyage, two successful captures of French enemy ships. So he did have something to show. He just didn't have a whole lot to show for three years, but he had these passes, they're called French passes. And those are the registration of the ships, which show that they were indeed French ships. And he turned those over to the governor to show that he did work within the, the guidelines of his um, privateering commission and that he did obey his orders faithfully and that he did intend and, he, and that he did capture enemy cargo to, and he had something to show to his investors. But that didn't turn uh, in his favor because when he and Sarah and the his two daughters arrived in Boston, it was a, it was, um, a betrayal and, a, and um, a lie. And he was captured and imprisoned um, in, a, in Boston jail for, um, almost a year. And um, as you said in your introduction, um, kept, uh, Sarah as an accomplice was also imprisoned. But I, as I mentioned in my um, presentation, she was eventually released because the, co the governor had nothing to prove on her. She was just his wife and she did not go out to sea with him. She was not a pirate. She was just a devoted wife. So it didn't it didn't work for Captain Kidd, and he was, um, I believe, and many historians believe, and to this day there's still efforts to get him pardoned, three hundred yeah. years later, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> but because his investors were some of the most prominent men in London, they were lord the lords, and the King of England, 
And they were all secret investors. Nobody wanted to know that the king and these lords were profiting from the war. So he was made a scapegoat and there was no way he was gonna get away with it. They were gonna, gonna get him. And his trial documents make it very, very clear. They're very difficult. I found it difficult to read because I was rooting for him and I was rooting for Sarah who I knew was back in New York with their little daughters waiting for him. And the king authorized a, a pardon of all pirates. So Sarah was certain that he would come back to her, but the king made a specific, um, a specific detail that Captain Kidd was not one of the pirates to be pardoned. So he was really doomed and um, he was imprisoned another year in London, in Newgate Prison, which is a hell hole, just a horrible place to be. Yeah. And um, his documents of writing into his self-defense, you can see his, um, his physical and mental and emotional decay by his handwriting and his his words, it's 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 very tough to read. I just thought it was very moving. Um, but there was no way he was going to be saved. And even at the very end, it was against the law to hang someone more than once. And Captain Kidd was hung. He the rope broke, he fell down. He should have been released, but they broke the law and they hung him twice. It was just disgusting. And put him in chains for years as an example to anyone not to turn pirate. Right, they cover the corpse in pitch, right? Right. And hang him outside of- On the River Thames. On the River Thames. It was, it was a grisly time. Yeah. Um, what about Sarah? Before, we're gonna get to Q&A um, in a couple of minutes here, but um, the, you write, that there really is no counterpart for Sarah in this history. Um, do you want to say a little bit about where Sarah fits vis-a-vis -vis other pirates' wives and um, what makes her such a remarkable um, woman for her time? I mean, she's, I mean, right, right from the beginning, it, it sounds like, I mean, she manages, despite all the, the sort of strictures against women in, uh, uh, in New York during this period, um, manages to carve out a fair deal of of independence and clearly has a lot of business savvy and, um, but uh, do you want to say a little bit about um, what what makes Sarah actually quite so remarkable and what the, and what the world of, um, I mean, this is dipping into your other book a little bit, but um, what makes Sarah so remarkable and, and, what, and what, what the life was like for the average pirate's wife, maybe? So there isn't a lot of information about pirate's wives. Um, uh, because they they couldn't uh, leave a lot of documents. But the reason that there's information about Sarah is that that she would lived a very long life. She lived to be seventy four years old. She was married and widowed four times. There's documentation about each of her husbands, which tell you the houses, the things that she lived up among, the candlesticks, the tasseled curtains, the down, cur the down comforters. So all of those details paint Sarah's life. What makes her remarkable is that arriving at the age of 14 and married off at the age of 15, she was very young bride for that time. Even for that time, most women didn't get married till uh, like 22. So here's this young girl who is widowed by the time she's 21, she's been twice widowed. The reason she becomes so fascinating is the twist and turns in her life that she doesn't let herself get down about. She just keeps figuring it out and overcoming them. And um, I think Sarah's story is remarkable for her commitment to Sarah to Captain Kidd, it's remarkable devotion. She could have easily stayed in New York when she got word 
that he was back in home waters after being gone three years. But she absolutely packed up her silver and her children and um, immediately went to their secret rendezvous place to meet him. And um, Sarah's life is uh, an example of tenacious resilience. It's what we see, um, it's an example that we can all take to our own lives of how to overcome enormous adversity and tremendous heartbreak of, of, of being widowed four times. That's horrendous. Sure. And um, she was also remarkably physically strong, first of all, to live so long, but to, to have five children survive childbirth and five of them lived to adulthood. That was very remarkable. She was in her 70s when she died, right? She was 74. Um, well, um, I'd let's start taking at least some of these questions and you're all, and I hope everyone's still watching, um, um, uh, uses the Q and A icon and sends in questions of their own. Um, uh, uh, first let's start with Karen who says, great presentation. I will definitely be reading this book. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, Lynn Hayden Finley asks, are there any living descendants? That's a great question. The answer is I haven't found any. And I looked I looked long and hard and um, I, I was really hoping to find some so I could interview them and add another dimension to the book. But the answer is I've not found any. Um, Barbara Swenson adds, um, is her former home in New York still standing? It is not. Um, I have walked- There have been several, right? It would there would have been several, but the main one that I showed the picture of um, is not there. But on the corner of Pearl and Hanover Street, there is a plaque that shows you where the colonial village was. And there is a building on Pearl Street, which is now like an apartment building or a business um, a business establishment. And that's where Sarah's house would have been. Was it 23 Pearl? Do I have that right? I think it was 90 Pearl. 90 Pearl. Um, uh, next question. Uh, Anne, Anne Haddad asks, uh, did the kids own slaves? Yes. Excuse me, I'm putting in my computer here. Yes, they did. Um, Sarah inherited from her first husband, William Cox, um, two slaves, and um, she had slaves throughout her life. She also had an indentured servant that Captain Kidd um, obtained for her when he was in London to first get his privateering license. And um, so, yes, they did. And there were young slaves, slave children, on the pirate ship Antonio, St. Antonio, when Sarah and Captain Kidd and the children were on the ship. Yeah, New York is by this, by 17, the early 1700s already, um, maybe even 1700, um, the largest slave owning city in the North. Um, uh, by its height, 20% um, of the population is enslaved. Um, and you and there are the the story of the of the two children that are purchased in Madagascar is horrendous. I mean, they follow they follow William even into the prison, right? Yes, yes. Um, and and they're kept in 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 the storage galley of the ship, and yes. uh, they're the same age as Sarah's children, right? Who are on board at the same time? Yes. Um, do we know anything about them? Was there, was there anything in the sources that could sort of point you to, to, to their story and, and, and what happened, what became of them? And... Uh, well, what we know about them is that they did um, stay with the kids and uh, stay with Captain Kid and Sarah Kid. Um, they were put on the ship that, that transported Captain Kid to uh, London for trial. 
And I don't understand why that would be the case. I really don't understand why they would have gone with him. That didn't strike me as regular either. It's not my period. No, but but it but they did, and they were in the prison with him. And um, there are, is a document in the manuscript room at the Library of Congress that is an inventory of the clothes, shoes, you know, clothing that they that the that the prison bought for the two little slave children. And it tells you how much they cost and how many they how many pairs of shoes they bought and things like that, which which is how I know that they remained with Captain Kidd because it says Captain Kidd's two slave children. Um, Kathy writes, uh, what did Sarah's first husbands do or her other husbands, I should say? So her first husband- her Professions. Professions. Her first husband, William Cox, was a merchant. He was a flour merchant. Flour was one of the most important trade goods in New York at the time. So he was a flour merchant. He also owned, uh, he, he also conducted um, business retail. He had a part owner, part ownership in a vessel and he imported goods and he and Sarah operated a dry goods store out of the first floor of their home on Pearl Street. Her second husband, John Ort. Not to interrupt, but uh, the first husband had something, uh, did I remember this right, that he had acquired something of a monopoly. Um, did I misread that detail? Uh, he and his partner had, had um, been given, along with some other merchants, a monopoly on the flower producing business. Right, which is one of the most profitable areas of New York's economy at the time, right? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And he died tragically and um, he drowned. And um, the second husband, John Ort, was a mariner and a merchant. And he turned out to be a ne'er-do-well. Um, he, um, ran up a lot of debts and um, borrowed from widows. So he had to have been an embarrassment to Sarah. And then Captain Kidd was her third husband and her fourth husband that she married two years after the death of Captain Kidd was a um, merchant as well from uh, East Jersey. His name was um, Christopher Rousby. And they had a long and successful marriage. They were married for 25 years. And they live, I can't remember now, in the outward, in the Bowery, where, where Stuyvesant's land had been? That's where they, that's where Sarah and Christopher Rousby lived for, yeah. for part of the time. Of and the then, time. then they moved to New Jersey. Okay. On a, and they had a farm there. Um, Anne uh, writes, can you tell, tell us about the sources you've uh, uh, found for Sarah's life as a widow in New York? The, the sources for Sarah's life as a widow, there's transactions, land transactions that give evidence of uh, the properties that she owned. Um, her last will and testament, she was a widow when she wrote that. She was a widow four times when she wrote that. Um, <clears throat> that is very, very specific of where she lived, who were the most important people in her life, which were her children. She was very close to her son-in-law, who she made an ex a co-executor of her estate along with her son, Christopher Rousby. She had three sons with her fourth husband. Um, there's real so there's real estate transactions and there's um, other inventory evidence that tells you about uh, her life. When she was widowed from Christopher Rousby, there is his will, which is very specific, that tells you uh, things about where they lived and what they had. 
And what was to go to Sarah, she was the, administ the administrator of his estate. And there's the inventory of his, of their estate, of their properties. And that tells you even that Sarah had two spinning wheels in her house and calico corners, calico curtains, I'm sorry. Um, and even the baby bed was still there. So there's a great deal of evidence to paint um, very clear picture of Sarah's life. Well, this gets us to Sherry who, asked, who uh, um, uh, asks, uh, what happened to the pirate's crew and the ship once they stole the booty? Um, well, initially when Captain Kidd sailed the adventure galley and one of his prize ships, to Madagascar, 90 of his crewmen mutinied and left him behind. So he was left with a very, very small crew. Um, what happened at the very end of his life is that six of his crewmen were uh, convicted and they were executed with him. Um, and um, I th um, M.M. writes, uh, why didn't they share the treasure with the crew to alleviate the mutiny? I think you just addressed this question, but um, there, wasn't, there wasn't any to, uh, at that point, to alleviate, correct? That, that's, that's correct, that's correct. Um, Doug Shear writes, um, how were other female pirates viewed, uh, Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed being the two standout examples? Well, I just want to make sure that make it clear that they those two women were pirates. Yeah. Sarah Kidd was not a pirate. She was a pirate's wife. Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed um, dressed up as men and rode on the pirate ship, their pirate ships. And um, they were later discovered. They, at first, they weren't discovered to be women. Um, they were quite fearless. And according to the records, um, the ship that they were on was captured. And uh, both of them were taken to trial. But they were released because they pleaded the belly, which meant that they were pregnant. So they were not hung with the other members of the crews. Smart. Um, uh, Barbara asks, where is Captain Kidd buried? We know that Sarah is buried in Trinity Church, which I did not know before reading this book. Um, I'm definitely not going to go look for that grave. Um, uh, where is Captain, where is William Kidd buried? He's, he is not buried. He was he was hung in chains. He was he was hung in chains for years, and he was never buried. The, the body just became yes. well, yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, uh, unless other questions come in, I think we are left with the the question we all want to know, which is where is the treasure? <laughs> Has anyone looked in Sarah's coffin? <laughs> what did you, what do you know and please share it with us okay we're gonna we're gonna form a, a party here and go go dig i will happily meet you with the shovel at any location at any time <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun that sounds great is there some uh, still out on the gardener's island because <laughs> so let's talk about gardener's island because that's really fun Gardner's Island is, as many of you all may know, is an island in Long Island Sound. And- um, Right at it, the end of the island, right? Right past the forks. The forks, right. And um, the owner of that, John Gardner, uh, met with Captain Kidd. He was known to be friendly to pirates for his own good benefit. He was terrified of them. And his wife lived there and he had a number of um, 
helpers to run his estate there, his manor house. Um, and he was terrified. So he knew to do the right thing. And, and that is do whatever the pirates wanted him to do. Um, <clears throat> and at the time, Captain Kidd was not necessarily a pirate, but he was a man, a wanted man. So um, John Gardner did accept um, uh, gold and treasure that Captain Kidd asked him to hold. And he did allow Captain Kidd to come on to his island and dig and bury his treasure. Uh, I understand that there is a marker there that was left by one of the descendants of John Gardner, sure. marking where the spot was that Captain Kidd buried his treasure. But Lord Belmont got word that Captain Kidd had buried his treasure on Gardner's Island and sent a message, a messenger to, to Gardner's Island and John Gardner under threat of being imprisoned, um, told him where it was. And that goal, all the treasure that Captain Kidd had buried was dug up and taken to Boston. And that treasure went with Captain Kidd to London and was turned over to the Admiralty, um, to the Admiralty there. And it was, it was later used to establish Greenwich Hospital. You said that, yeah. Um, dang, so we're not gonna get our treasure. Well, there's, there's a lot of rumors that it's buried up and down the East Coast. And um, a lot of people, even to this day, go digging. And some people go digging on Block Island, where Captain Kidd, we know, was to uh, secretly rendezvous with Sarah. Um, some people go digging there. People go digging. I've heard of, um, I got a call from a movie producer who said, can you just tell me? Just tell I me. mean, people were asking before if you talked to the descendants, and I understand. But uh, what I wanted to know is, have you talked to the treasure hunters? I have talked to one. Did you? And he didn't have any luck. He told me he didn't have any luck. Now, I don't know if he's telling me the truth, but he, 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 he told me where he went digging and he told me he didn't find anything. Okay. Well, um, let's, let's just say a little bit more just about that maybe before we, we, we end it. Um, uh, uh, Part of the story about Gardner is, is that um, that area of Long Island too, and like several coves along the North Shore, right, are are sort of like favorite dens, right? It sort of it pops up at different points in the story, right? And I know also that you know in I forget what the name of the cove was in um, in the East River, but there were also sort of these places where they were sort of they were reputed uh, in this period for being sort of uh, nests of piracy, right? Um, right? So maybe just for the sake of our audience, you could sort of share a couple of those um, places and then we can, we can maybe we can rouse the uh, treasure hunters. <laughs> well, a lot of people say that he, that, you know, Captain Kidd spent time in Long Island Sound when he was, waiting for Sarah to go from New York to Block Island to meet him where he had arranged a secret rendezvous. Captain Kidd was sailing around Long Island, Long, Long Island Sound, spent time at Gardner's Island, buried his treasure. He went back and forth a couple of times. He went to um, uh, his friend's house near Newport, Rhode Island and uh, left some gold with him. Captain Thomas Payne. So he he de, he made deposits, but it's it also seems evident that those deposits were then given back. So um, I I can't answer your question, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. I do know that Sarah knew where it was. They were very close, and she knew where it was, and. Um, there's no evidence that she ever retrieved it because that would have been really obvious if all of a sudden she was right. um, well healed. 
Right. And, and uh, so there's no evidence anywhere that she ever retrieved it. And it would have been very dangerous for her to do that. Right. And, it, and it really seemed evident that she wanted to move on with her life. And she's, she remarried again. She had three children. She had her two daughters from Captain Kidd that she was protecting. And it's so evident and interesting that she protected them. Be, and this is one of the things I really admire about Sarah Kidd is the way she protected her children. But her two daughters from Captain Kidd, she named in her will as beneficiaries, of course, in addition to her three sons, but she named them by their married names. So if you read her will, you would never know that she, Sarah, was ever Sarah Kidd because right. she signs it Sarah Rousby. Right. And her daughters are identified by their married names. So Sarah really tried to move on from that chapter of her life. Although she she did uh, name one of her sons William, and perhaps it's it's in memory of Captain Kidd. Seems suspicious. Yeah. Um, you know, they were they were really um, it, it's really a love story. Well, on that note, I'm going to um, encourage everyone to go out and purchase this book, The Pirate's Wife. Daphne, I'm going to say congratulations and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, thank I wish you, you all the best. All you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. I appreciate it. And I want to thank you all, too. Uh, this video will be on the Gotham Center's YouTube channel shortly. And I look forward to seeing you all at one of our future events. I hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you very much.